Welcome to the Michelle Mission, Two Men, One Podcast, Every Black Film Ever Made. My name is Vincent Williams, and I'm joined as always by my partner. Hey, holla at your boy. This is Len, a.k.a. The Bat Tribble. And here, the second week of the greatest of all Michelle months, Octavia April, we will be spending time with, with a film from 2021 that I think had a bit of a muted response uh, you know unfortunately the the pandemic i think kind of gobbled up yeah. a, a lot of the attention this would have gotten a needle in a time stack written and directed by john ridley and starring leslie odom jr and cynthia arrivo the choice of lynn webb yeah but before we get to that how are you sir i'm doing great visit how about yourself chilling cold chilling max and relaxing Watching us as we stream live from Yunk Junk, Philadelphia's premier video podcast palace in the Maniunk section of Philadelphia. And we're streaming live to all points north, south, east, and west, which means Twitter, which means Facebook, which means YouTube. And shout out to each and every one of you out there in the chat. Hello, missionaries. Good evening, one and all. Oh, and I'm seeing, seeing in the chat a very special hello to my good friend, Terry, who is... Hits me up, Vincent. I swear like clockwork every week after the show. Mm -hmm. Did I miss it again? Did I miss <laughs> it again? We're a moving target. <laughs> yes. Yes. We're a moving target. She has timed it correctly. All she right. Here at the start of the show. Slide in like Eddie Kane Jr. <laughs> Beginning of five heartbeats. Amen. Amen. All right. So before we get into the show and all of our special features, ladies and gentlemen, we would... Be remiss if we did not take a moment mm. to pay our condolences to the friends and family of the recently departed O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson, who had friends and family. He did. He you did know, indeed. Regardless of your feelings about the man, mm -hmm. you know. You cannot knock um, his athletic accomplishments no 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 nor to a degree his acting uh career because he did have a acting career um but he is certainly more of an infamous name at this juncture in sure 2024 but oj simpson passed away recently at the age of 76 years old after battling cancer um vincent you're not like a really Big sports guy, and that's that's historic here on the, no, on the mission. No. But you know, a movie, TV buff, especially of the seventies and eighties. So you definitely were there in the heyday of OJ Simpson. Did well, you? well, you said the sports accomplishments. It's, it's funny. I was having a conversation. One of my best friends was out of the country all through the seventies. His dad was a diplomat, and oh, wow. and he and I talked about. Our O.J. Simpson was the cultural figure. Okay. So I remember, I'm sure you remember, there was a comic ad throughout the 80s for Dingo Boots, where he was O.J. Dingo. <coughs> I seem to remember that. Yeah, and and yeah. then certainly, I've mentioned one of my favorite conspiracy films. Oh, is uh, Capricorn, Capricorn Capricorn One? Yeah, that he's yeah. in, and then you know the naked gun work he did, and so I like that was my O.J. Simpson. Yeah, yeah, you you know, like I knew, and that was a lot of people's O.J. Yeah, Simpson to be well, a lot of people of our generation, mm -hmm. because the generation before, because you know, you know, let's not knock it. He was a record breaking athlete sure, sure you know otherworldly and some of his accomplishments in college football and especially in pro football in the later 60s and early part of the 70s mm -hmm. um so he got his bona fides on, on on the on the playing field but then he made the shift to acting like mm -hmm. a lot of athletes do especially athletes who you know if you're lucky enough to be you have a fairly attractive um, black man. Oh yeah, and he he made the move. Um, I only recently, in recent years, came up, like fell into Capricorn One, mm -hmm. and it is an interesting movie. It, it's not a good movie. Yeah, it's, like, it's interesting. Let's be clear, it's more interesting than good. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. You know, don't go running out. Sorry about like, that. Easy. Yeah, I ain't gonna say that <laughs> at all. But my OJ was. 
you know, it, like he was in the Naked Guns, but Naked mm -hmm. Guns, he was to a degree kind of like making fun of himself a little bit. Right. Which apparently the joke, which I didn't find out till after the fact, was that he was so nimble as a football player. Right. And which he the was. The joke of him being clumsy was the joke. Right. Because cause you're mentioning about, you know, the, the OJ Dingoes for for generations and you probably just didn't mention it and didn't think of it. When we think about OJ in a, in a more commercial sense. Right, literally. Right. Yeah. It's Hertz rent a car. Right, right. Running, right. Through, the Running through, through the airport. the airport. And leaping over like tall bags of luggage. Right, right. And like a, a three piece bow. suit. And looking smooth yeah. doing it, man. Yeah. And he was, and that, that was, he put Hertz rent a car. He put on the map. Yeah. You know, that was my OJ. Right, but but as as you <laughs> said, the past 20, 30 years, I think again, you you know, he really is there is the last yeah. couple of generations. Yeah. They're OJ. Right, they're OJ. And it's been fascinating hearing people who weren't there. Yeah. Not really understanding how big of a deal this murder trial was. Whoa. I mean, it, because every inch of it was like it, it and you got to remember this was the days but there's no internet no there's no social no media. no you know, like there was there was break they broke into live television everywhere and it wasn't the president no it no. wasn't even to a degree oj simpson it was just video of his white bronco yeah driving up the road yeah and it, it was all across the country and you could not look away because right. you didn't know what was going to happen and you know i have to say as we're in the midst of donald trump you, you know in court every day but yeah it's it's so easy to not pay attention to it i think that may have been the last like that's one of the last vestiges of that singular yes cultural event yes. yes you're absolutely right that we all kind of shared and like like yeah. like like you know everyone remembers what you, you're talking about the bronco chase you remember when the verdict came out which is a year later which was a year later so it was a whole year yep where just as a cultural event, and you know, you don't want to lose track of the fact that two people lost their lives, mm. but there was this weird disconnect where we were talking about two people had lost their lives, but it was this circus. Like it was an actual circus. It was a, you know, there there were bit players who got their own little thing and, and it was, it, it, it was a, a it was a cultural moment. Yeah. 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 And, it, and unfortunately, the ugly part about it is that on the other side of the cultural moment, this guy who was used to being like one of the most popular people in the world, he started to kind of like lean a, a little bit into that ugly stuff. Um, remember when he threatened to come out with the book? Talking about, you know, what if I had look done it look, or whatever. The whole the whole thing was just surreal. It was just surreal. And 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 you know, not for nothing. It's worth noting, it it's sort of like, I mean, you know, let's just call it what's it's sort of like how how the, the, the firestorm around Bill Cosby. Like the barely subtext was that these were white people's favorite black people. Oh, yeah. And they had done this. Like, if Jim Brown had been accused of double murder, it would not have, be, it, it would not have been the, 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 the veracity in, in, the, in the fire around it. Because, you know, Jim Brown was Jim Brown, and O.J. Simpson had sort of positioned himself Purpose. from the very beginning very intentionally. as the anti-Jim Brown. You, yep. you know, as he famously yep. said, you know, I'm not black. Yep. I'm O.J. Yep. So that when O.J. Simpson is, and, and then, you know, you think about everything that was happening with the LAPD and, and how Johnny Cochran masterfully brought that to the fore, and it, it was just this perfect storm. Did you ever, did you ever see the, the five-part documentary, Oh, O.J. in oh, America? What I was going to land on 
what I was going to land on as somebody who lived through it and, 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 you know, had said, I don't need to hear any OJ anything ever again. I watched the, um, the Ryan, um, Ryan Johnson, not, not Ryan, Ryan Johnson. Johnson. Um, I know you're talking about the, the docu right, right. The docu drama with Courtney B Vance and Sterling K Brown and, and Cuba Gooding Jr. Yeah. Which was fantastic. And then frankly, people start talking about this ESPN documentary about it, which is hands down one of the best documentaries I've ever seen in my life. Yes. And I recommend it to everyone. Everyone. If you think you know everything about the trial, you don't you don't know nothing. You don't so. know. And and if you think, how are they gonna stretch this out to five parts? Easy. It could have been ten parts. It could have been ten parts and you would have been there for parts. every single right. one. And just like you said, the the where this story of O.J. Simpson himself, the man, and then this whole murder and the trial, where all of that intersects with um, being black in America, mm -hmm. being just being black in the in the world. Yeah, it is all covered in that documentary. It's so masterful. I mean, like it is. It, like you said, it is a. It could be a master course on how to do a documentary, right? And to make it relevant to to us, I I always think about the like like the first couple of episodes where they talk about the LAPD mm -hmm. standing and how what we've come to call copaganda. Yep, which I think may have come from this documentary. Would not be surprised. You, you know this articulation of the fact that these television shows that sort of valorize the police. Basically, CBS's programming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Corrupt police have used that to kind of serve as cover yep. for their misdeeds. And, you know, I think about the fact that <laughs> that the woman who, you, you know, I think the, the D, I think she was a DA, who railroaded the Central Park Five. Mm -hmm. They used her as the consultant for, or the creator maybe, of Law and Order. Yes. So that I always think about she that. She was consultant on that. Right, but it was because of this O.J. Simpson documentary that you know you really see you know, the power of these shows and how they can very easily turn into something that can be corrupted, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh. But yeah, 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 O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson. Well, like you said, he did have friends. Look. He did have family. Look. And our condolences to them. What I've always wished is for everyone to get some measure of peace. Yeah. So. So hopefully you find yours. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into our show, which means that we're going to hear from each and every one of you. All right. As we listen to your emails, or as we like to call them. Mrs. From the Missionaries. So what else is going on, Lynn? We have... Emails, Vincent. Ooh, missives from the missionaries. Ooh. 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 Missives from the missionaries. Missives from the missionaries, ladies and gentlemen. Vincent, I have the first one here. It is from Michael Sykes. What's up, Michael? It says um, in the subject line, the Red Fox stories, Norman, is that you? Oh, yeah. Hello, Len and Vincent. I listened to your podcast episode of Norman, is that you? That episode was so good, I listened to it three times and still counting. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Vincent, you said, okay, and he quotes, okay, so many people have these stories about Red Fox. There are, there are tons, like Lena Horne has a story about the episode where she came and taped her episode of Sanford and Son. Yeah. I don't know if Lena Horne ever spoke to him again. He was mm -hmm. really crass with Lena Horne. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's one of my favorite episodes from season two. Yes. Along with Rated X. 
Card Sharps, mm -hmm. and Lamont Goes African. Yes, yeah. Please, Vincent, yes. let me know what happened between Lena Horn and Red Fox. What are the stories that you heard that happened between them, these two, and or Red Flock or Red Fox generally just about his show? Love your fan, Michael Sykes. Uh, this was either because I cited the 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 biography of Red Fox, but this may have been in Lena Horn's biography too. Where, where for those of you who don't know, Lena Horn was a guest on um, an episode of of Sanford and Son, where where she plays herself. Right, and the reason why she's playing herself on there is because of how the character Fred Sanford. Right, love Lena Horn. Like everybody, lo you know, love Lena Horn, and you know, the important thing is that she was on there. But apparently, I don't know. He was just really crass. You know, talking about what he wanted to do with her and what he would do with her oh. and this, that, and, that. and you know, the Red Fox dynamic, I think, really comes from the fact that I think he was a working comedian. Like, he had been a working comedian since the 40s and 50s, kind of a hustle. You know, the famous story is that he was, you know, I think he was Chicago Red mm -hmm. was his nickname because they didn't want to confuse him with Detroit Red, right. who was Malcolm X. So then, you know, he becomes a comedian, this and that. But when you look at Red Fox's career, he becomes famous a little later in life. Yeah, of course. So he's always kind of on the fringes, you know, the Chitlin circuit, this and other. He's seeing people around him being famous. But then he becomes famous. And I all, oh, you know, you get the sense that he had this kind of bitterness. He had this sort of you know, he was keeping score from when he wasn't famous. Yeah. And I think the dynamic between him and Lena Horn, you know, Lena Horn has been Lena Horn since the forties. So for Red Fox and Lena Horn, you, you know, he kind of was, was real disrespectful, frankly, mm. you know, just, just sort of disrespectful. And, and, you, you know, I think I talked about in the episode with, um, with um I just forget my girl's name. I don't know which one. Who's in Norman is at you. Plays his wife. Oh, uh I've got Ruby D in my head, but that's not right. Yeah, it's not Ruby. Oh no, it's not. That's not Ruby D. It's not Ruby D. Uh hold on. Hold on. I'll get it for you. Norman. Looking right at her. Is Pearl Bailey. Pearl Bailey. So you know Pearl Bailey talks about having these run-ins with him. And again, I think that kind of cohort of those Chitlin Circuit acts mm -hmm. in the 70s kind of mashed up against. Well, I mean, the word on the street is that Red definitely was feeling himself. Yeah. At that time. Yeah. Um, the thing is, is that because of how popular he, how popular he is at that moment, you know, and because of where Sanford and Son is in the ratings, I mean it's I mean, the it's number, number one, one show, show. yeah, number one show for like like three four seasons. Mm -hmm. That's right in a row. Um, he there are people you know like what happens when you're a star. Mm -hmm. They they cover for you, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I've seen uh, Demont Wilson, who say what you want about him, maybe career wise, talent wise. Mm -hmm. You know, he was the other part of that show. Yeah. And he doesn't mince any words. Like, you know, like, I, I like working with Red, but mm -hmm. Red was him and I didn't me. I mean, the the sort of crossover success that she has, she acknowledges that it, it is 100% because of Red Fox. But LaWanda Page oh, yeah. talks about the complexity of working with Red Fox as the show went on and it got more popular. So, you know, again, he, he's a complicated dude. I do have to say, Michael, you, you named some good episodes, but I do have to give you a demerit because you did not name the best episode of Sanford and Son, which would, of course, be Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe. Is that season two? I'm not sure which season that is, but that is, of course, the season with big money grip with the swivel hip. Right. 
And and in Michael's defense, that may not be season two when he was naming season two. He was episodes. naming season two episodes. Me, me, Mama's baby. What, you, you, me, you got the phone out now. You got to look it up. What season is Mama's baby? Papa's maybe where big money grip with the swivel hip comes in and says that he is Lamont's birth father because he was dating Elizabeth before Fred. Uh, let's see. Then he went off into the army and then came back on leave and thought that that was when the child was conceived. But then there's a plot twist. <laughs> is it there always? Uh, that is season three. Season three. Does that have the writer on that? Let's Who wrote see. that episode? Alunga Adele, Ray Galton, and it looks like it looks like it was multiple. Okay, it's four writers on here. Okay, Alunga Adele, Ray Galton, Alan Simpson, Norman Lear. Okay, or All Norman right. Lear's uncredited. Sure, 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 sure. So there you go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, Michael, thank you for your yes, email. Yes, Michael, we're going to get off of Sanford and Sun. <coughs> we got an email from Nick Nicholas. Hey, what's up, Nick? Reflecting on early 90s black movies. Okay, all right. Hello to the men of, me, of the Me Show mission. Sorry for the late emails. I hope you both are doing well. Before I get to the initial post, I recommend Vince read The Spike Lee Reader by Paula Massoud because... He is a Spike Lee fanatic. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. I do like a do like a um a book suggestion. There you go. So the month of April for me is black coming of age movies. Mm-hmm. Or Nick. I watched Dope over a week ago and Very I rewatched nice. Just Another Girl on the IRT, Excellent. the first movie of its kind. After rewatching the movie, I came out with both an observation and a question. My observation is that Just Another Girl on the IRT, along with other movies like Boomerang, Strictly Business, A Rage in Harlem, and The Five Heartbeats, came out during the sort of hood movie explosion of the early 90s. Although Boomerang was a box office hit, it was met with mixed reviews from critics, particularly white ones. Mm -hmm. I felt like if those movies did not fall under Boys in the Hood, Juice, New Jack City, or even Jungle Fever to a certain extent, People did not really give it attention or it went under the radar. The early 90s for black cinema, while booming, felt like only a particular genre could thrive, which was the hood and gritty movies. People who were non-black in most cases were interested in these often violent, traumatic movies and barely paid attention to movies that were, but barely t paid attention to movies where... Where uh, I think what he's trying to say that did not fit that description. I'm making sense what he wrote. Mm -hmm. Not saying that the aforementioned movies are not great, but I do feel like movies such as Just Another Girl, Boomerang, Strictly Business, Rage in Harlem, all felt like anomalies and went a different route than what was popular at the time. I could definitely see that. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that. <coughs> <clears throat> A question that lingered in my mind that could be a discussion point if, is, do you think we will ever see a movie like Just Another Girl from the IRT in mainstream media? Just Another Girl is a movie that defied stereotypes on black girls. The main character, Chantel, was given agency and she was not a one-note character. Notice how her pregnancy did not overshadow the movie. While Just Another Girl hit on issues still discussed today, it was a vibrant and fun movie. Like Leslie Harris said before, it was a film Hollywood did not want to portray. I say this because while it did gain a cult following for the years to come, this movie is still seen as underground and almost forgotten by people who are not black. While I am happy that black women directors are thriving like Cassie Lemons, Cheryl Dunye, and Dee Rez, I really hope that those black woman directors mentioned or anyone in general can give us a film of a black girl just living life without trauma and just being herself. But in my opinion, I don't think we will as much as I want to. What do you guys think? Nick. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think the landscape is? Well, I think the landscape is open for that type of 
project. I just don't think that, I think the beautiful thing about, you know, since um, Just Another Girl, with the with streaming, mm-hmm. there are more outlets for this, mm-hmm. this, these type of projects. And thus, with these outlets, you then have, um, it doesn't just have to be a movie. Right. You know, because I'm immediately thinking about Insecure mm-hmm. uh, and just Absolutely. the other works of, of Issa Rae. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because her... TV show rap shit was basically about two girls. Sure, sure. Although they got canceled. They did get canceled. Um, and then there's another show that's on, um, I believe is Amazon Harlem. Mm-hmm. It's about four, yeah, four yeah, girls. Yeah. Uh, I mean, those are older. Those are women. Well, that, that, yes. They, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, but I think that it, it, I think that it can happen. I, I, I want to say that it did happen. I'm just trying to. I'm, 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 it's hard for me to find, pull one. I mean, this is. It was interesting that the protagonist of the most recent, well, one of the protagonists of the most recent Transformers movie was a black girl who was, well, well she actually was older, but, but she was playing younger. I can't pull the name out. It's going to be awkward because Dorian's going to be here in a few weeks. What was Dorian and Simone's movie? About the Jin. Jen, I think Jen fits into this. That does, you know what? Yeah, I think Jen. That does, and it, very neatly, very neatly. Yeah, Jen does fit into that. Uh, and it's, and and it's a good movie. You have to look it up, ladies and gentlemen. Look up the Jen D J I N N, and then after the first movie that comes up, look again because the first movie that comes up is going to be a horror film. This is not a horror <laughs> film. This is about a young Muslim teenage yeah. uh, girl. So you got to look da- look down. You know, maybe look up the Jen, and it's just Jen. What well, it's all right, Jen, but it's spelled. You like doing like the Django. Sorry. Well, I'm saying that so people spell it correctly. Right, That's mostly right, why I'm saying right. it. Because they'll, they'll look up Jin. The D is silent. The D, the D, the D, the D is silent. The D is silent. Uh, but, but, and, I mean, I'm, I'm shocked. You didn't say your beloved Pariah. The only reason I didn't say Pariah is because he mentioned d Res. Okay. All right. So I'm figuring he already right. was already. Right. Right. And right. I know every time you get a chance to talk about Pariah. True, but th- here's the thing about Pariah, though. Pariah's already, what, 15 years old? Yeah. You know, true. it's already like another gener- like a true another generation earlier, you true. know? True, true. I agree. I, th- I think, um, you know, I have to say, I don't feel hopeful for the art house film culture <coughs> generally. Yeah, but just another girl. Before. See, the thing, just another girl wasn't an art house. Yeah, it, but it, 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 it played there because it was it underground. It, right, right. But it, it would have been an art house film, except that we don't usually grant black films art house film status. Yeah. Like it was a small film. It was on, you know, not that many screens. Like I remember, you know, because I, I saw it in the theater and it was at one of these small film houses where I saw it. And I just don't know. I don't know what that ecosystem looks like going forward, frankly. Like, unless you're in New York, unless you're in Los Angeles, I mean, here in Philadelphia, I think we're like on breathing on fumes Mm. with that. Like, you think about where you can go see a small film here in Philadelphia. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, it's it's few and far between. And, and this is a big city. Like I said, you leave New York and Los Angeles, I think things get a little shaky. Yeah. Shout out to the Philadelphia Film Society. Because, Absolutely. 100%. Because they, they keep the small films. Yeah. And they keep it in a prominent place. Mm-hmm. Not like hunkered down like in in uh, um, in Old City, Philadelphia, which is like you got to travel to. Right. The Philadelphia Film Society, um, they man a... a top of the line theater right in the heart of center city philadelphia where they have all types of films coming mm-hmm. back back and forth through there um pulling back films from yesteryear to replay them on on the big screen so shout out to them they're doing great work mm-hmm. uh yeah i <coughs> you're saying it's not hopeful i don't know i don't know but 
We shall see. We shall see. Thank you, Nick, for the email. Thank you, Nick. We got an email from Terry Plain. What's up, Terry? Hello, Vincent and Len. Wow, what a zeitgeist moment. I was about to comment on Len's recent top five of Afrofuturism books ready for a movie. Mm -hmm. And I found a similar email from last year that I sent that had a few recommendations. Len, you were on the mark for Dread Nation. <clears throat> I'm familiar with most of the other authors you mentioned, so it was a solid list. And yes, N.K. Jemison and uh, M.D. Okorafor are the reigning queens. Mm -hmm. I am really excited over the buzz of Tommy Adinye, Ad, Tommy Adiyame, Children of the Blood and Bone trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited about that too. Yeah. Um, other Afrofuturism titles I recommend are Nicole Glover's The Conductors and Le mm. Leslie Penelope, The Monsters We Defy. I feel like I somebody told me about The Monsters We Defy. The Conductors is on my pile of books right now. You've got a big pile. Well, you know, I do new fiction, old fiction, nonfiction. That you have individual piles? Right, right. That's how I read. I read new oh. fiction, old fiction, nonfiction, and I start back up again. So where, where are you in this cycle? I just started Crack is King by Donovan Ramsey. It's nonfiction, and it is excellent. Nice. It's about the crack. Well, it's about the crack here. Nice. And then, so I have new fiction next. I guess I could read The Conductor's. Do you just but grab if I'm being, from the book, the pile? You know, it's supposed to be a pile, but you know, I I cheat a little bit. Okay. I'm I'm probably gonna read some Colson Whitehead next. Okay, but it's on my pile, and I've heard nothing but good things about Ter the conductors. Terry continues. The Does book he Donovan or Duncan? I think it's Donovan Ramsey. Okay, when crack was king, it's excellent. The book that still chills me the most mm -hmm. is Underground Airlines. Yeah. That explores the question, what would present day America look like if the Civil War never happened? Yeah. Where four states in the South still practice the involuntary enslavement of people of color and bounty hunters work like the FBI. Whoa. Yeah. 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 Heard about that. Now, let me ask you something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Terry, uh, Chaz, I'll keep up the great work. Onward to 400. Thank you, Terry. If you heard mm -hmm. that this book, the Underground Airlines, mm -hmm. was being adapted into work, mm -hmm. how would you feel about that? I am the wrong person to ask because I am fundamentally against the alternate history, what if slavery never ended? because just just the on the ground facts of slavery it's it's no way to make slavery continue you know if we if we do 1865 just with the advent of technology and everything like maybe you could have tacked on another 20 years just the facts on the ground you know the cotton gin and everything and and, and what was going on kind of globally with shipping it just wasn't a viable model so that every time we have those, what if slavery never ended? What I always get to is it's just, you just want to make it like something about slavery. Like it's actually one of my little bugaboos, like, like the, what if slavery never ended conceit if it goes past 1885. <laughs> so I'm the wrong person to ask. Apparently. Apparently, because I've thought about it. I mean, look, look, we're nerds and I'm black. So I've been thinking about black nerd shit. And it's always, what if the Nazis won World War II? Or what if slavery never ended? Like those are all, you know, those are the big two ones. So we've kind of dealt with those a lot. I've said this before, it's because we're here. The best what if the Confederacy won the Civil War that I've ever read, it was this little comic series from the 80s called Captain Confederacy mm. that was set during modern times. And, and they basically the, the Confederacy won the war. And then we just sort of were at, a, you know, it was two countries. But, you know, like I said, slavery is going to end in 20 years anyway, 
just because of lo the logistics of slavery, but then it kind of dealt with the repercussions of what that looks like, though. So, you know, we, black people still had sort of second second class citizenship, and but like World War I went a different way mm. because America couldn't get involved, and because World War I went a different way, World War II happened kind of, Right, and because World War II didn't happen the way World War II was supposed to happen, America, like the 20th century wasn't the American century, so like it was just this really thought out series, and then it had this wonderful kind of bibliography after each issue where it had all of these history books. Oh, okay, and because of that, that's why I'm like, anytime you have it was 2020. Slaves are still in the fields in Louisiana. It's like that's that's just that this just doesn't make sense. True, so, but I mean, you know, like that's why I'm so glad that HBO thing fell apart immediately. Yeah, because you know it, it just doesn't make sense. Sorry, you probably weren't looking for that answer. No, I mean, I'm looking for your honest answer. Yeah, yeah, that's, so that's my, like, cause I remember when Underground Airlines came out, like, I had it in my hand, and I rolled my eyes, and I said, yeah, I'm not doing this. Okay, so you didn't read it. Yeah, I didn't read it. Okay. Like, intentionally. So. Fair enough. So I haven't read it. Maybe they maybe they deal with it. Maybe they deal with it. Maybe that. there's no cotton gin. Or maybe, maybe slavery looks different. Maybe it looks different. That's, because I, I would imagine, because I hear you, but why? As, as the model, right? But I'm saying, why do you have them? Like, like what is what is sort of the what is the purpose besides just sort of you? you, you okay, we because <laughs> we can go down this road because now we get to whiteness. Like, is it like are we just propping up poor white people, which is always part of it? Like, okay, well we're propping up poor white. Well, what's that look like though? Like, how do you maintain? white people in their jobs. Like it, it was always a balancing act. Like, like you know, we're gonna prop up good, poor white people, but we also can't have the slave labor take poor white people's jobs but so much because then poor white people get angry about that. And like, it's a whole, yeah. Well, maybe like oftentimes when people do these, the Civil War, the, 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 the South won the Civil War and it's still slaves. Nobody really thinks about that like nobody thinks about this stuff they just won't have some black people being slaves with iPhones <laughs> which I don't know I've not read this book I don't know I didn't read the book I don't know did you read the man in the high castle I did nor did I watch it Philip K Dick yeah yeah I like that I like the show I've heard good things about it uh all right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Terry, for your email. We got one more email, Vincent. This is from Michael Lockett. Hey, Michael. What's up, my brothers? A very quick aside. Okay. I've added another review on iTunes and have been running my mission recruitment office. Thank you, sir. We appreciate more it. More cinema troops are heading to the front lines of black American cinema. <laughs> I urge any other regular listener to do the same to help the podcast. Michael said to repeat this part. I urge any other regular <laughs> listener to do the same and run a Michelle Mission Recruitment Office to help the podcast. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. I listened to the, re the critique and rewatched The Book of Eli. Mm. I must admit that I always forget about this Denzel flick when I am thinking about his filmography. It's a really fun film. I believe he has a good time with it as it's a departure from what he usually gets to do, much in the same vein as The Magnificent Seven, which you should review if you haven't. We have not We have yet. not. I but, haven't seen it. Oh, you didn't see it? I didn't see it. Wow, you're, like you're a huge rest, uh, like Western guy. I love Westerns, I love Denzel Washington. How often do you get to see one on the big I, screen? I know, and, I know. It's like a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup just sitting there. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Denzel Washington and Chris Pratt. I look, there are other people in the film. There's that other people like in the movie too. Yeah, I think it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. You should. You should. Yeah. Well, it'll be coming. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that. Uh, oh, on my time travels, I listened to and watched Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. Mm. Lynn's favorite film of all time. <laughs> Sweet Jesus, I haven't heard you two go 
<laughs> at, go at it like this on any other movie. The back and forth made me think of the Iron Sheik giving an interview on NWA <laughs> Wrestling and being blindsided by Sergeant Slaughter. <laughs> oh, that's a good pull. Oh my God. <laughs> Now, that's my wrestling right there. Oh, my God. Uh, you, both, you both made great points, but Vince, like myself, is willing to put films in the context of their time and influence then. I find myself unable to laugh at many comedies from the 60s, the 2010s, because I... The 2010s... Mm, okay, no, no. I find myself unable to laugh at many comedies from the 60s, to the 2010s because I initially judged them unfairly from my present vantage point. It's easy to pick Sweet Back apart from a 2024 vantage point, but in the context of 1971, it put in some vital work for black cinema. All the best, Michael. Sure, it did. Here we go. But you also did not have to use your son in a movie where your young son is laying naked and uh, 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 um, and uh, engaged in a sex act. Engage, basically engaged in a sex act. Yes. Um, you are right. He didn't have to do that. There's, there's, there is no artistic value to that casting mm -hmm. or that scene mm -hmm. at all to the movie. It is one of. I mean, and I'm, you know, like. Gratuity is gratuity, and sometimes yeah. you, do, depending on your lens, you can go with a little bit of gratuity. Sometimes you won't see a titty, but like to use your, I mean, to use a child in use that, a child at all, it, use a, ch a child at all in that situation mm -hmm. is I don't care what year it is. Oh, I don't know. It was a lot seventy one. I don't care. It's still it's, it's still not cool. All right. And, but then the, the fact that it, it is your son, because I guarantee. He would not have put his daughter in that, in a similar situation. If that was his daughter well, of the same age, he would have not have put his daughter in that situation. I, I don't know. No, he, I, well, okay. I want to give him the benefit of a doubt that well, he no, would. Melvin was a wild dude, and I don't think, and I don't think it would, and and I don't think it would have played the same way. Well, I mean, and, and if it did play the same way at that time, I mean, that's a whole different dynamic, though, with a girl. It's a whole different. But I'm just talking about. A child, boy or girl, it doesn't sure, matter. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, you do. I mean, you do it's have a different to admit. dynamic, but it's still a child. Yes, it's still a child. But look, right now we have people who talk about, oh, I had sex with my babysitter when I was twelve. Or like right now, we have a difficult time acknowledging that a heterosexual experience for an underage boy is abuse. Like right now, at this exact second, 2024, you know people, because I know that you, like just statistically, I know that you know men. Like statistically, I know that you know men. And yes, statistically, men. if you know men, you know at least two dudes who had sex with somebody older than them when they were like 12. Yes. And how many times <laughs> have you said, you know what? That 16-year-old girl, that 17-year-old girl, you, like, that was abuse. No, I understand, I understand that. Okay. And I'm saying that, so, like, in 1971, yeah, it was wrong. But let's not act like it wasn't, it's not some context there where the, the sort of overriding opinion was, oh, okay, good for the young boy. Like, it was wrong, but, you know, not, like, let's not act like he was an outlier. I'm not acting like he was an outlier. I'm just saying that in this movie that people, like, want to kneel down on the altar for what it meant for the culture at the time. Yes. I, the fact that you can excise this scene totally out of the movie. Look, you're, yes. And whatever value you, you, the rest of you are still getting from this movie, you know, it's still there. It doesn't change the calculus at all. Yes. It's 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 it's, it's icky. And like I'm not sure who you're fighting with. Like I don't, like, I don't think anyone's fighting for eight-year-old Mario Van Peebles 
to be. But naked you're talking. To, but but, on, on, but like, y'all talking about see what looking at it in the context of its time. Yes. So I'm looking at it in the context of his time as just making a movie and writing a story. It doesn't have any place in the movie. I mean. It, so it's gratuitous. It's where he got but, his but name if, from. But then if you're going to be gratuitous. Like, 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 I mean, it is part of the plot. I just, like, it is actually part of the plot. I don't like, like he says, ooh, you got a sweet back. Like, that's actually how the movie starts. It's not like it just shows him, and then the, the film pans over, and it's a dude, and they call him sweet back. I mean, you know. All right, thank you. Look, look. Got me started off. You know, you know, apparently. Melvin took your cookie when you were 12. <laughs> it's like. Everybody keep a list of Lynn's enemies. <laughs> Melvin Van Peebles, play. It's like the most <laughs> random, bizarre ass collection of people that he has a fatwa. <laughs> that is our email. I don't ladies. like Buttercup. You don't like the Powerpuff Girls? No, just Buttercup. And she knows why. It's like okay, I sure don't don't I sure don't bring up Buttercup from the Powerpuff Girls. I right, sure. All right, go ahead. Right. That was the blonde, right? Hey man, look, <laughs> look, I just ride with you. That was I, the blonde. I, I'm just with. That you. was the blonde Powerpuff. Right. Puff. I just like Buttercup. Yeah, right. Sure, sure. I know like. Was she? I can't remember what were their like, names again. I, I know like Jim Kelly, play. Melvin Van Peebles, just if they in the room, I got to, if they would, they, you know, I got to, all right, they coming in with their people. Oh, shit, I guess I'd jump on him because Lynn going, oh, Lord, I can't believe Ty Mock came in here with two other dudes. <laughs> Certainly Lynn can't be in here with Ty Mock. He's got Ty Mock beef. I don't know. But that's my man, so I guess. I got no beef with Ty Mock. Come on, go on. Look, I just. Just try and just try and be a team player. Go ahead. Come on. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, thank you for your emails, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to have your thoughts, uh, hear your thoughts shared here aloud on the Michelle Mission, write us an email at Michelle Mission at gmail.com. That's M-I-C-H-E-A-U-X-M-I-S-S-I-O-N at gmail.com. And if you really want to help our show, just like our good friend Michael suggested. Yes, sir. Feel free to give us a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. And please tell a friend about our show. Tell our friend about the podcast. Tell them about the YouTube show so they can be here on time every Tuesday at 7 p.m. like Terry to watch us as we stream live. And they can hit the bell, subscribe, and be notified when we go live every Tuesday. And also check out all of the shorts and edited clips that we put out throughout the week. All right? Okie dokie. It's now time, Vincent. Mm -hmm. It took one week off. All right. But it's back. Now it's well rested. It is time for the top five. Top five. Who's your top five? Top five, ladies and gentlemen, where I give Vincent a list and he gives us his scintillating commentary mm. on said list. Scintillating. It is scintillating. I like to think so. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just realizing I made a mistake on the top five. Uh-oh. <laughs> I have all of my information here. Mm-hmm. Except for number five. Well, then, hey, freestyle it. Maybe we'll, we'll fill in the information. What is it? What's the list? What's the list title? The title of this list, keeping it in theme. As okay. We're going to be um, focusing in April on the works of Afrofuturism. Yes. Black sci-fi. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> what I have done mm -hmm. was thinking about black animation specifically okay right over the last 
24 years, so the 21st century. Okay. Okay. And I wondered in that space, which often does deal with future futuristic uh, characters, mm-hmm. right? Who would um, like what characters? Mm-hmm. If we were to pull from all black animation, mm-hmm. if we were to put them into one team, mm-hmm. like a Justice League, mm-hmm. but only from 21st century. Only from 21st century. Black animation. So Black Vulcan is not He's eligible. not there. Who would be the blackest league assembled? The blackest league assembled. All TV right. edition. TV edition. Okay. So only from television. Only from television. Which means that Spider-Man... Spider-Man, Miles Morales. Miles Morales is not in the running. Sure, sure. Okay, all right. Off the table. Right? All right. All right. Now, I said there, and and thank you, Dylan. Dylan put up on the screen Mm -hmm. the person that I have designated as number five, so I will read them as number five. Okay. Which I believe means that instead of getting five, I may have only gotten four. Okay. (laughs) Maybe we'll add one. (laughs) One. Which Which is good because... I actually know who I would actually prefer for my number one to be. All right. But number five. Number five. Would be Cyborg. Cyborg. Of Absolutely. Titan, Teen Titans Go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cyborg is laid back, half teen, half robot, who's more interested in pizza and video games than in fighting crime. However, he does not suffer fools. Mm-hmm. He's and while he is constantly getting on his fellow Titans' nerves with his unbearable shouting and slothlessness, he always comes through in the clutch in times of danger. He, his technological intellect is invaluable, providing the team with their vehicles and weapons galore, and even more priceless are his extensive combat and tactical skills. So Cyborg would be number five. I love Teen Titans Go Cyborg. I love Teen Titans Go. Yeah, it was a yeah, fun I love series. Teen Titans Go. And, you know, I also love how angry it makes some of our fellow nerds. That you liked. Did you? We're pre- not taking it seriously. Well, considering that that is, while it's not a spinoff, but it is kind of sure. like a derivative of the Teen Titans series that preceded it. Yes. That was also well, well liked. I mean, if we have an opening, I'd put Cyborg from that on the list on here because they're two separate characters. They're totally two separate characters. Totally yeah. two, two separate characters. But I, yeah, I love Cyborg. There you go. Waffles, waffles, waffles. Waffles, waffles, waffles. Okay. Number four. Number four. Would be Virgil Hawkins, a.k.a. Static. Interesting. From the TV show Static Shock. Is that the 21st century? 2000s. Wow. Then absolutely. The show revolves around Virgil Hawkins, a 14-year-old boy who uses the secret identity of Static after exposure to a mutant gen gas during a gang fight, which gives him electromagnetic powers it was the first time that an african-american superhero was the titular character of their own broadcast animation series the show approached uh, several social issues which was positively received by most television critics and nominated for numerous awards including a daytime emmy Um, and the popularity revived interest in the original milestone comic Mm -hmm. and introduced Dwayne McDuffie, uh, Static's creator, to the animation industry. Yeah. Lo- oh, come on. Now, come on. Love Static. Were you a fan of... Fa- I know you like the character. Oh, the the comics? <laughs> yeah, because of the character. Comic. Yeah, absolutely. But were you a fan of the show? I was. I couldn't get into the show. Why not? I think the... And I think my main reason for not getting into the show is because I'm an animation guy. So it's got the animation has to speak to me, and I, sure. I didn't really like the animation. It it was it was a downgrade, you, you know. Quite honestly, anyone who's making cartoons during the Justice League Unlimited moment suffered in comparison, right? And then the fact that he was sort of tangentially in the animated universe, yeah, didn't help. But yeah, I love Static. All right, yeah, I loved it. Well, he's number four. All right, yeah, good list. All right. 
I'm wondering if my mistake is missing number number three. Can you flash on the screen who who you're showing as number three, Dylan? Because mm -hmm. I think that's that may be the one that I'm missing. Because my number two is definitively my number two. Definitively at number two. Right, and I think I may have just missed putting in my number three here. Miss number three. Yeah. Yep, that's who it was. I thought that's what it was. Because number three. Number three. Is Black Dynamite. Black Dynamite. From Black Dynamite. From Black Dynamite. You could have five characters from Black Dynamite. <laughs> and it could have been, been a whole list. league. You, 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 had, you had Black Dynamite. You had Cream Corn. Yep. You have that old Bullhorn. Mm-hmm. You have a Honeybee. Yes. And then rounded it out would, of course, be Chocolate Giddy Up. Yes. See, yeah. there you go. That's five right there. You, that should have been your list. See, but you can't because you still need superpowers. And as, as fly as all five of them are, Black Dynamite's the one that's got the superpowers. The superpowers, right, right. Because he Black Dynamite. He's Black Dynamite, yeah. You know, maybe, maybe Chocolate Giddy Up got some Chocolate powers. Chocolate Giddy Up. He got some yeah. he got, he got some. Right, right. right. He got Chris Shaw P got them hot-ass hangers. <laughs> <laughs> Slot him in there. Chris Shaw P. Maybe Tasty Freeze and get in. No, no, I don't. I don't, I don't think they, have, they, they they don't make the cut. Pimp. They don't make the cut. Captain Kangaroo pimp. Nah, he's nah. a pimp that looks like Captain Kangaroo. Maybe they. Maybe, no, no, no. Okay. Maybe they. Maybe in the unblack league. The unblack league. All right. No, but not in the blackest league right. assemble. Okay. No. Well, Black Dynamite. Black Dynamite, however, from the animated series. The animated series, which I would think I'm not speaking heresy here, is better than the movie. Yeah, but that's just saying how good the cartoon is. I mean, it is it is amazing. Because the movie is amazing. The movie is amazing. The cartoon is, is even more amazing. It's even more. It is yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. And, and, and yes, Black Dynamite has the superpower. Absolutely. The fact that you could do a cartoon series, ladies and gentlemen, where this man is fighting for the children in the orphanage. Orphanage is a home for whores and children. Whores and orphans. And you do not, it needs, does it with a straight face. Yeah. That is a superpower. He actually fights O.J. Simpson in an episode. He fights Speaking Michael of, Jackson in an episode. Michael, right, right, right. Michael Jackson. Who's he the fights Kermit the Frog. Kermit, yeah, yeah, yeah. That Frog Curtis. That, that Frog Curtis. That Frog Cur Curtis, actually. <coughs> Saffron Curtis, we don't want no. Oh, yeah. Don't nobody want no smoke from the Sesame Street workshop. <laughs> yes, so Black Dynamite. Black Dynamite. All Definitely right. number three. So how, well, how's my leash? Uh, yeah, I'm so trying far. to see who one and two are, because if Black Dynamite is three. He's number three. I got well, one might, that I can they're throw all, They're all a team. A team, all right. So, but Black Dynamite. Right. He, so who's he, number two? Because so he's, he's our muscle. He's a muscle, all right. He's a muscle. You got the technological guy and cyborg. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Then you've got... Static with the electric electricity. Electric, electricity. He's got the electricity. You know what I mean? Right. He flies on this little, you know, you trash can lid. With his black dynamite, right. it's your muscle. And kung fu. And kung fu. You know, kung fu. No chuckies, all the bullets. Right. But then, as much as he's the muscle, mm -hmm. you still need a powerhouse. You need a powerhouse. You need a powerhouse on your team. All right. And, and there ain't nobody more powerful than the my girl, Garnett from Garnet. Steven Universe. Absolutely. Garnett, ladies and gentlemen, from the animated Steven Universe cartoon series created by Rebecca Sugar, based on the real-world mineral Garnett. Garnett is a gem, a fictional alien being that exists as a magical gemstone projecting a holographic body. She is, in fact, a fusion. Two gems combining personalities and appearances as one shared holographic body formed by two gems named Ruby and Sapphire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who choose to remain permanently fused out of love out for of each love. other. That's right. Um, Garnett was famously voiced by the British singer Estelle mm -hmm. um, and, and was the de facto leader of the Crystal Gems who protect humanity and Earth from danger. Garnett's stable relationship while fused is used as a metaphor for the power of healthy relationships as Ruby and Sapphire together are stronger than any one gem on their own. <coughs> Huge Steven Universe fan. Yeah. Um, I gotta give a shout out to my good friend Kennedy, who's the one that turned me on to that show. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it was one of the smartest suggestions she ever made. Mm-hmm. And fell in love with, a, you know, Garnett right from the door. Mm-hmm. Her story is a beautiful story uh, because when the series started, you don't know that Garnett is a fusion. Right, you actually spoiled it. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, you know. it's like 15 years old. I know. Uh, but trust me, the road to finding that out yeah. and then everything that comes after that. It is. is It is a magical journey. Stronger Than You is one of my favorite songs. Right Stronger now. Than You, sung Stronger by Estelle. You, sung by Estelle. And, and, and sung specifically for Steven Universe. And now it is like a mainstay in Estelle when she mm-hmm. does shows. Has to do it. Love, love, love. Garnet. All right. And number one. With, number one. Let's see what, I'm assuming I know who this is, but I guess we'll see in a moment. I don't think you know. Okay, who's it going to be? I'm pretty sure you don't. Because number one. Uh-huh. It's a little controversial. Okay, okay. Who we got? But we need a leader. Okay. We need somebody who can can rope in mm-hmm. this this staff group. Okay. Of Garnett, Black Dynamite. Black Dynamite. Cyborg. And Static. And Static Shot. Okay. And who would that be? <clears throat> And that is going to be one, Cornelius C. Fillmore mm. from the show Fillmore. That's a good. That's a good pull. About the seventh grader who was a juvenile delinquent with a record that was caught raiding the school's new chalk shipment. Mm-hmm. He was arrested and given a choice by the safety patrol officer who caught him: either help him solve another case or spend the rest of middle school in detention. Fillmore decides to help out, eventually uh, joining the safety patrol. And then the show is based around him and his partner, Ingrid Third, voiced by Tara Strong and called the third throughout the movie, at X Middle School in, uh, in the suburbs of Minnesota, where the show basically becomes like this cartoon satirization of, uh, uh, of police procedurals. But 70s. But 70s. 70s police procedure. Yes. We're talking like like the streets of San Francisco. Manix. Manix. Yeah, Barnaby, Barnaby Jones. Jo- yeah. Yeah, my mouth, man. I was oh, about yeah. to say Barnaby uh-huh. Jones. And, and it's Fillmore, this black kid who's a little rough around the edges, but now he is on, he, he's just solving crimes. Yeah. And you can't get over on him because he's where you were. Yeah. He knows exactly everything. He's like, I've seen this before. Like, it, it, it takes no prisoners. He is no joke with, it, with his glasses and his baldy. Yo, Fillmore was ahead of his time. The series only lasted like th- two seasons, I think. I don't even know who Fillmore was for. I know. Like, I was convinced that it was a fever dream and someone had made a cartoon just for me. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I thought it was, like, I was like, do I owe the IRS money? Or I don't have any children that I'm paying child support. Like, like you know how they talk about where they give away the Super Bowl tickets? Yeah. And they arrest people who, like, owe back child support? Yep, 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 yep. yep. That's what I felt like Fillmore was. I was like, is this a trap? Mm-hmm. F- Fillmore was good, man. Man. And, and hard to find. It's, it's, is it on Disney? It, it might be on Disney Plus. Okay, if it is, I. I but you're right. For years, it was. Yeah, for years, maybe. Because for years, I, did I did I tell you about Fillmore? You don't want to tell me about. I was about to say years because ago. you know I'm a Fillmore, and I would part of the reason I would tell people about Fillmore was to kind of make sure it actually existed. <laughs> <laughs> like I really did think, am I the only one that saw Fillmore? I love that damn Fillmore. So you didn't do John Stewart. Or Craig Williams from from Craig of the Creek. Now, but I will let Fillmore stand. Fillmore is there because Fillmore definitely is. He's a leader. Oh yeah, he is a leader. Oh yeah, and I think he, that he's grounded enough. Mm-hmm. But like I said, a little rough around the edges. Right, right. He, he that he that he black, came up cyborg and black dynamite. Exactly. Yeah, and Garnett will have his respect. Right, right, right. And he'll you know some of. 
Static shocks, you know, being a kid. Right, right, right. You know, he was like, yo, dog. Right, right. It's, 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 calm down. Calm, calm down. Yeah. yeah pour, pour, Black Spider Man before Black Spider Man. Pour water on Right, because he got like jokes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, so I think film book could work. Now, mm -hmm. here's the reason why, because I'm glad you mentioned those two. Mm -hmm. John Stewart. Reason why I didn't do John Stewart. Mm -hmm. If you watch on all the episodes of Justice League, mm hmm. John Stewart, he, he just he's just a little bit too high headed. Yeah, he's just a little bit he's just a little bit too high headed. <laughs> right. And like, and sometimes I just don't want to be listening. Well, you know. You know what I mean? I love John Stewart. But and, he's, he's a cop. And, and that's the other thing. So he don't really know how to deescalate. That, that that's the other thing. <laughs> right. Like we don't need right. no black cop. Like right. Right. like Fillmore is a safety patrol, right. but that's just because he's trying to get out of shit. Right. You right. know what I mean? Right. Right. <laughs> right. Right. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So we don't we don't need no cop. Yeah. Yeah. And now your 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 and my boy. Yeah. Yours first though. Was, Again, was, another one you introduced me I was, to. I'm saying, y'all don't know this, but I was obsessed <laughs> with Craig of the Creek over the past three months. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and he got me in it because now this is how I spend my work days. Look, Craig of the Creek is up on the TV. Imagine Game of Thrones, but with some little kids. Yes, it is. It is. It is 100%. And, and don't get me, but it's still happening now. So it's not Game of Thrones back. You know, right, it's, right, right. It's, it's not it's, a period piece. It's kids playing in the well, uh, in the creek. It's right in the, creek. In the title. It's yeah. In the creek. So they're in the woods. Right. They're yeah. basically in the woods behind their house. Yeah, having adventures. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know what? Here, if you are a fan of comic strips, if you're a fan of uh, Calvin and Hobbes, which always took place in the sure. creek behind his back, imagine Calvin and Hobbes, and now it's just filled with a, a like a, a a whole neighborhood of kids, right? And Craig of the Creek, right? The lead of the of this show, young black kid, who it, who is mapping the the creek, leads his two best friends into misadventures and adventures mm -hmm. all throughout the thing. Here's the reason why I didn't choose Craig. Love Craig, of course. Craig messes up a lot. Well, he's a kid. Okay, well, yeah. he can't be. We, he can't be. We can't have. Can't have no. Craig we can't have Craig and Static on the show. Can't have Craig. All right, all right. Okay, I'll allow. It. <coughs> we can't. No, I'll no, allow it. no. Make Craig grow up. Craig will grow up. You know, Craig of the college. Craig, maybe Craig of the college. <laughs> college. Yeah. Craig in the creek. No. All right. No. 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 With with everything that he's building. Yeah. He builds with cardboard and duct tape. Sure. 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 Did you finish it? I am in the last season now. Okay, so you you you're at the the heart of the force. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Craig of the Creek. Craig of the Creek. So not so that's why he didn't make it. Right. Care. Right. Right. But I was I was tempted. The point is, go find Phil Moore. Yes. And Craig of the Creek is actually around because that's on like HBO Max. No, it's on. I watch it on Hulu. On and Hulu. Yeah. Oh, is it on Hulu as well? It, mm hmm. I mean, no, I watch it on Hulu. I didn't know it was on Hulu. It was Max. on HBO Max, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. So. But yeah, de definitely go check out go check out Fillmore first, because Fillmore is actually, I think, only two seasons. Yeah. Um, Craig of the Creek is four seasons, and it's like, wow. <laughs> right. Then there's a prequel movie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, it really is an epic saga. Yeah. And and the four seasons are like about 40 episodes. I was about each. to say. I was like, oh, we, we can't still be in season two. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's yeah, it's good watching. Mm -hmm. It's good watching, fun watching. All right, All right. so that's All right. my blackest league ever. All right, blackest league, good league. Thank you. All right. All right. Now, now it is time for the game of kings. The game of kings. As we move into, as we're all black and animated. <laughs> the realm of six degrees of Derville Martin. <laughs> Six Degrees of Derville Martin, ladies and gentlemen, where I give Vincent two actors and he has six films or less to connect them to the animated one, Derville Martin. Derville Martin. Of 70s fame. Mm -hmm. Keeping it in theme. Okay, all right. We are reviewing Needle in a Time Stack. Okay. What's which the theme? stars Leslie Odom Jr. Mm -hmm. and Cynthia Erivo. Mm -hmm. Vincent. Yes. In Six 
films or less. Okay. Connect Dervell Martin to to Leslie Bibb. Who was that? A white woman. Can I see her picture? There's her picture. Ah! I know who that is. Yeah, I know. I know you know her. That's that's Mrs. Bobby. That's Ricky Bobby's wife. Named her child Walker and Texas Ranger because they're winners. <laughs> if we wanted them to be losers, we would have named them Dr. Quinn <coughs> and Medicine Woman. Oh, yeah, she's fantastic. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's Ricky Bobby's smoking hot wife. Mm -hmm. Woo-woo, all the money. Love the money. All <coughs> right. You remember her name in the movie? What was her name? What was Ricky Bobby's smoking hot wife's name? Tammy? Close. Carly. Carly. Are you Carly going? Bobby. Carly Bobby. Carly Bobby. Carly Bobby. That's right. The, the mother of Walker and Texas Ranger. Badass kids. I'm going to jump on you like a spider monkey. <laughs> I'm all hopped up on Mountain Dew. All right. So Dervil Martin is in Five on the Black Hand Side with Dick Anthony Williams. Dick Anthony Williams is in Mo Better Blues with Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington is in Philadelphia with Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is in the Green Mile with Michael Clark Duncan. Mm-hmm who is, portrays the pit boss in Talladega Nights, the ballad of Ricky Bobby. Very good. Because Ricky Bobby says, I want to hope you have sons, strong, beautiful sons, and they feel the pain of having their legs taken from them, which then upsets him. And he said, don't you put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby, which is the funniest thing that Michael Clark Duncan has ever said in his entire life. And at least once a month I tell somebody, don't you put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. The point is, if you haven't watched Talladega Nights, the ballad of Ricky Bobby, you should. You still haven't watched it. No, I've seen it. I said I've seen oh, it. Oh, I thought you I thought you were, yeah, I'm not watching it. No, I've said I've seen it. I'm linen. I reject joy. <laughs> I said I seen it. I said it was fine. I liked it. Mm -hmm. I didn't love it like mm -hmm. you, but I mm -hmm. liked it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't reject joy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway. Well, I really thought you were going to pull Broadway actors. All right. Who else? Who, who we got? I Well, I started to do Leslie Howard, but he's from the 40s. <laughs> Leslie Howard, who got caught up in the Red Scare? <laughs> I, I can't do that. All right. Leslie Howard, are you a communist? <laughs> All right. Number two. Number two. In six films or less. Six films or less. Connect Derville Martin to, to Cynthia, Cynthia Rothrock. Who, what is that? You don't know Cynthia Rothrock? Did you know Cynthia Rothrock yes. before you did this? Yes. Who is that, Lynn? She's been like in a lot of action films. She was like one of the big act. She's like the big action woman. Let me of see like her. the. Is she the karate white woman from the '80s? Yeah. Okay, karate white woman from the '80s. All right. I mean, truth be told, though, most of her films were direct to video. A lot of them. Okay. All right. Not all of them. All right. Yeah, but right, and and none of her films were actually in the movies. Like she was in uh, the films that she was the lead. Yes, exactly. Like she's in like uh, she's in Bloodsport, right? Is she in Bloodsport? She in Bloodsport? I don't think she's in Bloodsport. No, she's not in Bloodsport. Did she's in Street Fighter? No, no, she's not. In Street no, Fighter. you know, always it's like Bloodsport and um, what is it, Kickboxer? Are you sure she's not in Bloodsport? I'm looking at her filmography right now. She's not in Bloodsport. What is she with 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 um Jean-Claude Van Damme? 
Well, without without knowing the movie, I don't see any of these movies that. Uh, which one I think is a John Claude Van Damme movie that she's in? Nope, that ain't it. Uh, she's one hundred percent in the Jean Claude Van Damme movie because that's the only thing she would have been in that was in the movies. No, no, she is not in. No, <laughs> no. Well, first. You're wrong because I just found a movie that I didn't know was in the theaters, but she was she was in, and it has bigger names than her in it. Um, wow, I don't see I don't see a John Claude Van Damme movie on. I could have swore she was in one of them John Claude Van Damme movies, and she done played a white woman in Street Fighter. Nope, Street Fighter is not on her on her filmography. So look up the film itself. All right, let's do that. And start with Bloodsport. So let's look up Bloodsport first, okay? Bloodsport from 1988, starring Jai Claude Van Damme, oh, Forrest Ford. Whitaker. Damn, Forrest, Forrest Whitaker was in Bloodsport? I think the person you might be thinking of is. Yeah. Leah Ayers, who plays Janice Kent in Bloodsport and who was a master, uh, was a yoga teacher. Is that who you're thinking about? No. That's I'm the, about the woman you just... That's the only other woman. That's the, that's the woman... Who is she in that was in the movies? Well, let me go back. Like, how you pull this person? It's a Cynthia. So like Cynthia Nixon, you just you just skipped right over like you just skipped over somebody who's an actual a actress. I wanted it to be Cynthia Nixon would have been easy, right? So you that would have been easy. So Cynthia, and and Cynthia Nixon, even though I think she would have been easy, it, it, my first thing goes to TV. Right, right. I mean, I would just went to the Sex and the City movie. What would she have? What would she have been in that was in the movies? Um, she was in a movie from nineteen in nineteen ninety six. An Eye for an Eye, which stars Sally Field and Kiefer Sutherland. How in the world I is know. she in an eye for, with, with Kiefer Sutherland I know. and Sally Field? Directed by John Schlesinger. Are you sure this is the same woman? It's the same one. It's, it's in our filmography. I'm looking at it. I'm looking dead at it. <laughs> you think I would, why would I lie about this? Who's going to lie about these things? Um, we'll find it, 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 it with Kiefer's. How you? How is she in a non kung fu movie? <laughs> I mean, this night. That's... <laughs> like, do you look this stuff up? Like, like I'm talking about. Like, you just pick somebody. You don't even look and, and see a <laughs> viable path. You just kind of pull somebody. No, I t <laughs> honestly, like you can't pick somebody that you ain't never heard of. No, that's that's not true. The reason why, honestly, I made a mistake. I, I will. <laughs> it's my night for mistakes. Right, just right. So, so, now, so now I got to figure out your mistake. No, 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 no. There was a, the movie that I actually thought was released directly into theaters. Was what? Martial, uh, martial Law. Why would you think that was released into theaters? Because I actually thought, I actually thought that was a, um, not John Claude Van Damme. What's his other name? What's a uh, tall boy? Steve. Steven Seagal. I thought it was a Steven Seagal movie. I was like, oh, she, she no, was in, you're she thinking, was in that. Yeah, you're 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 thinking about. Uh, he may have had a movie called Martial Law. But when I saw that, I was like, oh, okay, well, there's a connection. All right, well, look, Kiefer. But but, it, but that's it's not. All right, so so that's so, not it. Fine. So so Kiefer Sutherland. <sighs> yeah, this is the most rando person. <laughs> Of all times, but also, also another another oh, thing. I'll do. I'll do. do uh -huh. respect. I, in all honesty, uh -huh. I thought because of your love of like kind of like genre flicks, right? That Cynthia Rothrock might be somebody that you. Who no, knows what no, you're pulling out of this no, nerd no, 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 brain no, no. of yours? No, no, no. She's like Billy Blanks. Exactly. Like she's never actually on screen. And I did think she was in a Jean Claude Van Damme movie. Like if I saw her on a big screen, I thought I would see her with Jean Claude Van Damme. Yeah, but but Vincent, 
we all know Billy Blanks. You know Billy Blanks movie titles. Right. right. Nobody knows Billy Blank all movie right. titles. So look, who's not to think look, if you know look, Billy Blank movie titles, look, I think you know Cynthia Rothrock movie titles. Look, okay, so so Derville Martin. <sighs> Derville Martin is in the final come down with Billy D. Williams. Billy D. Williams is in um, Batman 89 with Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson is in A Few Good Men with Kiefer Sutherland. Kiefer Sutherland is in a film that no one has ever heard of with the 80s white woman who used to do karate in the direct-to-video films that would come on Cinemax at 3 in the morning when I'd come in and I was too hopped up to go to bed. And somehow my uh, 11 year old brother who never went to sleep was also up and we'd sit and we'd watch her and the whole conceit of the film was, ooh, it's a white lady doing karate. And we would watch white lady does karate seven final revenge. But no, apparently she was in the movie with Kiefer Sutherland and Sally Fields that no one has ever heard of. How's that? How'd I do? I wasn't even listening. <laughs> like I'm just like the circus gimp. You just, you just, just, I'll just say, toss him a banana. He'll figure it out. Just like, just no, just, just pull, you just put your head, put your hand in a hat and pull out a name. Lady Dragon was released in theaters. What theater was Lady Dragon released in? I saw Lady Dragon in the theaters. No, you did not. I did so. What year is Lady Dragon? 1981. Uh, I didn't see Lady Dragon. Right. It came out in 92. Um, <laughs> Lady Dragon was released in theaters. I feel like I saw one of her movies in the theater. Stop. No, you didn't. I feel like I did. You saw it on Cinemax at three in the morning when you came in from being out and you couldn't go to sleep. I don't know. You like made a sandwich and turned on the TV and then she had on like a velour sweatsuit. <laughs> she was in the super cop. She was in, in Yes, Madam, <laughs> a.k.a. the super cops with Michelle Yao. Which, you know what? She sure was in super cops. She sure was. That was released at theaters. Not over here. Wasn't it? I don't think Super no, Cop. I saw, I, yeah, Super Cop. And maybe the, it wasn't released Yeah, there, it wasn't released over it here. A, I saw it in a theater. In a second run theater yeah. that showed karate yeah. movies. But yeah. yeah, yeah, none of those early Michelle Yao, Jackie Chan movies were in the theater here. But she was in Super Cop because she played the young white woman who knew karate. Right. Like that was her whole deal. Like I mean, that was deal. that was her whole hook. <laughs> I'm a blonde haired white woman that can do a modicum of karate. Wow, she didn't do any film with um, with Steven Seagal. No, she. That, and I was gonna say that. She, I mean, I, or 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 Van Damme. She wasn't big enough to do anything with Steven Seagal or Van, or Van Damme. I could have. sworn. Or she was in one of them John Claude Van Damme movies. Oh, so we so you wanted to look up Street Fighter, right? Like who was the woman? Like in Street, Street Fighter? Fighter. Like Street Fighter, I feel like. Like what are his big? It's like Bloodsport, Street Fighter, and like Kickboxer, right? Like Kickboxer. Is yeah. she one in any of those? No, she's not. It could not have been two white women doing karate. This is where we are in our lives. Kylie Minogue is the is the white woman in Street Fighter, and she's not the love interest. She's actually doing karate too. Is she? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. I like like you know. I don't know these. Why would I have known these people's names? I mean, every. I mean, it, it's a cult favorite. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but Cynthia Rothrock, Street Fighter. I think sometimes you can actually see the cocaine falling out of Jean Claude Van Damme's nose in certain parts of it. Everybody loves the movie because of um, Raul Julia. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, his final role. His final film. It's, that's why you got to be careful about what you do. 
You never know what your final statement's gonna be. I know. You'll be Raw Julian Street Fighter in that stupid hat. I know. Mm -hmm. Didn't, who, who died after doing Caligula? Didn't somebody die right after doing Caligula? One of them old British guys. Yeah, it sure, he sure did. I think it's like that was his last movie. Yeah, but, but I mean, you know, at least it's Caligula. What do you mean at least? I mean, at least it's sort of a... A notorious right, it's film. Just, it's the most prestigious porno ever made. <laughs> yeah, but, you know. Street Fighter. Uh, I wouldn't bastardize the word prestigious by <laughs> aligning that with I mean, Caligula. I'm just saying, they had a budget. <laughs> Like it was a budget. I wouldn't put that it was a, side by side with right, Caligula. You know, prestigious parents are like, yo, he spent like ten thousand dollars <laughs> on baby oil. <laughs> have you ever seen the unrated one? Yes, I, I have not. Like I remember watching it, and then they said, you know, it's an unrated one. I was like, an un. What else are they doing in the unrated one? Let me tell you. Sure. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm never gonna watch it, but because um, I can't, because I've only really watched the unrated one more than once. Um, so I think the unrated one is the one where he punches the horse <laughs> in the in the uh, puts his hand in the horse's ass. Okay, well, well, well. There you go. Because the orgy is in both, right? The, of course. Yeah, the orgy is in both. That's the whole point. So I think the it's about him putting the. His fist in the horse's ass. Yeah, and there's there's some other stuff I can't remember. Okay, there's some there's some uh, yeah, 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 there's yeah. Some, there's some it's some wild it's some wild shit. Yeah, 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 Caligula. All right, well there you go. You All know. right, well that's the only Cynthia you can find. That's the only <laughs> actress whose name is Cynthia you can find. Well, you the only one you could come up with was Cynthia Nixon, and like I said, she would have been too easy. Yeah, she'd have been too easy. All right. Who else can you think of? I mean, I can't think of him because that's not my part of this bit. Exactly. Like, you're part of the bit is to find them. And to also stump you. Right, right. Well, you certainly stumped You've been me. stumped. You, yes, with with the white kung fu lady. And who would have thought the white kung fu lady would stump you? I right, look. Mr. Billy Blanks. Billy Blanks. Well, you know, Billy Blanks is a cultural icon. He did Tabo. That's a shame. Cynthia's mad at that. <laughs> Billy Blanks getting more for his signature than I am. Uh, no. I know she mad. I'll be someplace heated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, right. that was Six Degrees of Derville Martin. It's time for us to get into our review here for Octavia April of Needle in a Time Stack. I'm ready when you are. Needle in the Time Stack. A 2021 American romantic sci-fi film written and directed by John Ridley and based on a short story of the same name by science fiction writer Robert Silverberg stars Leslie Odom, Frida Pinto, Cynthia Erivo, Orlando Bloom, and Jaden Wong. <coughs> In the near future, time jaunting or time travel is possible for the very rich. Time shifts that result from these time jumps are commonplace and whole industries have risen up to help people store their memories. Nick Mickelson, played by Odom, is an architect married to Janine, played by Arrivo, a photographer. They seem happy, but after being struck by the third time shift in a year, Nick starts to feel something is off. Needle in a Time Stack, 2021, directed and written by John Ridley here the second week of Octavia. Third. A third week of Octavia April is the choice of Lynn Webb. Lynn, what would you ha like to say about Needle in a Time Stack? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is about the idea of marrying romance with science fiction, or in this case, you know, in... in uh, Octavia April, Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. Even though this is more just strictly t uh, uh, um, science fiction mm -hmm. than Afrofuturism itself. And the idea of marrying those two things is offers itself 
up for a world of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Because when you think about romance, when you think of the, about the idea of what love represents in your life, it is all about the possibilities that it, it that it creates. Mm -hmm. It's all about the um, the story that love begins to tell on your life as you take your life and blend it with someone else to create a whole new life of its own. Mm -hmm. And marrying that with with science fiction is interesting because. There's some who will argue uh, love is science fiction. It, it doesn't seem like it should work. <laughs> it doesn't seem like mm -hmm. that math don't math. Yeah. You know, like Absolutely. They don't make, what, what, you and you, this, how? Mm -hmm. You know, where is the alchemy? And yet it, it somehow d does come together and create something extraordinary in, in most, in, in most, cases and that moves on now you put layer on top of that the idea that you know it's 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 uh, if you're a fan of like marvel movies or or genre fiction right now you've been introduced to the idea of the multiverse in almost every form of genre television or movies in the last 10 years which is all about the possibilities of changing one circumstance. You know, the spider doesn't bite um, Peter Parker, it bites Gwen Stacy. The spider um, gets knocked from Peter Parker and it, and it somehow bites Miles Morales, you know? Um, the Flash, you know, saves his mother from being killed and now his whole future is, it's all about what happens if you just pull apart one moment in time. The mind boggles of, of where that can take a story. Mm -hmm. And this movie, beautiful with the title, Needle in a Time Stack. We've all heard about how hard it is to find a needle in a haystack. That is the, the, um, the saying that is playing off of you know, it's very hard to find like a small needle in a in a haystack. But if you find it, it makes a big, big difference. If you're in that haystack, you, you'll find that needle because it'll whoop, ow. And this movie suggests what happens if just one little thing changes in your past and the ripple effects of that in the life going forward or the butterfly effect of what that means going forward to reference another piece of IP that is played along these same lines, right? Um, there are other pieces of IP that are played along this, these same lines as well, but that's the first one that is coming to my mind. This movie suggests that Leslie Odom and Cynthia Revo in the beginning of this movie were meant to be, they were meant to be uh, a couple, but for some reason, they have these lingering doubts about, you know, how solid the foundation of their life is. They've, they've got a beautiful home. They seem to be very successful. He, him as an architect, her as a photo, uh, photographer. They have a lovely, a uh, dog named Charlie that they both adore. They love one. Of, they love one another. They were they were destined to be, and you're you're introduced into this life, and you're like, okay, this seems kind of cool. And then somewhere along the lines, about ten to fifteen minutes into the movie, maybe even a little longer, there is all of a sudden you hear talk of a time wave or time being changed in some way and uh, uh, that concept of time travel being something that people can do if they have enough money time travel has been commodified to to a degree that if you are rich enough you can actually just walk back in time you can go into a room and go back in time and 
change and uh, despite some type of rules they tell you, you can actually, you know, the idea is that you can relive a memory, but you could also kind of start messing with stuff. And you're introduced to the concept that there was someone who was an old friend of Leslie's named Tommy, who at one time was also married to Cynthia Rivo's character, who is now still longing for his, for his ex-wife, is going back and subtly just changing things. And you're like, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, okay, it sounds interesting. Let's, let's see where this is going. And sure enough, a time wave comes and it changes things. But everything still seems the same. They, they talk to one another. They recognize one another. They still remember one another. They're still in love. It's like, okay, well, I guess we survived that one. And now they, they go on about their separate ways and they say goodbye to Charlie, who is now no longer a dog. Charlie is a cat. Ah, a change. You see that there is a change. And as the fuzziness in their head starts to start percolating, especially in Leslie Odom's character's head, uh, he begins to, to realize, I think your ex-husband is messing with us. I think he is trying to cha change us. She agrees with him, but there's nothing that we can do about that. So she says, don't do anything about it. So then we are just left to deal with Leslie Odom dealing with this crazy feeling in the back of his head that he tells his sister about. She is saying that, you know, you shouldn't really, don't even really worry about it. He goes on about his life until sure enough, a time swipe com comes, changes everything. They're no longer married. He is now married to his ex-girlfriend and Tommy has Cynthia back. And now we have to, he has to find his way back to Cynthia. And how is this movie going to, how is he going to make his way back to it? Sounds like a very interesting story. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a outline for an interesting exploration of a romance of what two people mean to each other about the inevitability of being together mm -hmm. and finding your way there in some way, somehow, despite all the forces that may be against you. And you're sitting down to watch this movie that has cast Leslie Odom Jr., who a captivating actor. Absolutely. And Cynthia Erivo, you know, a, just as captivating. Mm -hmm. Extremely talented actors who have reasonably good chemistry with one another. You believe that they are in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So you're sitting down to see how are these two people going to fight their way back to one another. Mm -hmm. Tommy, the, the antagonist in this, played by Orlando Bloom, and nothing says evil than a young white British guy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, and especially because it's Orlando Bloom, so it's like, oh, it's legless. But yeah, I'm so bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. so bad. I say that because the script says that he's so bad. He actually, he is a guy that is love sick for his for his ex wife. Yeah, it's really what he is. Yeah. And you could argue that maybe if if he was. Leslie's character, he'd be doing the same thing. Yeah. Trying oh, yeah. to change things because I, I, I need to get this back. So you're wondering, okay, how are they going to fight the forces against this guy? You're sitting down. Boom. I'm ready for this. And unfortunately, as great as a premise as that is, that is set up by Robert Silverberg in the short story of this movie, in the adaptation that John Ridley mm -hmm. has written and directed, none of that plays out. Because this movie does not care about Cynthia Erivo's character. 
She is merely just a pawn between these two, two men. Mm -hmm. She disappears from the movie for long uh, pieces of time. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. She yeah. literally like disappears, and when then she and when she comes back, it's really just to say one line and just keep it moving. You're not ever introduced to any of her inner monologue, inner thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't know whether or not she is pining for him. Sure, you never find that out whatsoever. You're introduced in the, in the beginning of this movie to the idea that Leslie Odom's character has an ex ex-girlfriend right that he had left right before meeting Cynthia Car Cynthia's character right and now after this time jaunt as they call it he's married to her that's mm -hmm. played by Frida Pinto who believe it or not is second billing in this movie yeah I wouldn't you wouldn't know it if you're thinking about the name of Leslie Odom sure. and Cynthia Revo and Orlando Bloom in 2021, but Frida Pinto has second billing. And maybe she does because she does spend a lot a fair amount of the movie. Saying, once you see the film. Once you see the film. Yeah. Once she shows up, she's there for a good bit of the time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because the, because she spends her time with Leslie Odom's character because in, in their marriage. But that's because Leslie Odom is trying to figure out why doesn't this feel right? Mm -hmm. Because this movie is more uh, uh, interested in his feeling. Yes. This, this movie is almost, it is almost 100% his point of view of this, ro this broken romance. So, and the one thing about a, a, a good romantic movie is that you need both people's point of view. Mm -hmm. You need to care about the two people involved in the romance. Mm -hmm. And the only other person you are given any opportunity to care anything about is Orlando Bloom's character mm -hmm. <coughs> and his fight for why he wants to rearrange things so that he can get back with Cynthia Revo's character and the... Um, how things play out in the end when he realizes where he actually should be. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, make, we'll spoil it, but later. Um, that's the only character you're really introduced to given any I idea of what's going on with inside their mind. There's only ever really ex an exploration between Orlando Bloom and Leslie's character mm -hmm. of how they feel with one another and how they deal with one another. Again, not a bad dynamic, but this is a romantic film first and foremost. It does not care about the two women involved in this this romance at all. They are merely just chess pieces to move around the board as John Ridley sees fit in the story. Um, and that makes, unfortunately, for a disappointing movie for me. Mm. Uh, it makes for a movie that, okay, if you don't care about the characters, then why should I care about the characters? Mm. Um, and it then has me, if I don't care about the characters, now I'm watching and I'm focusing on every, everything else. Mm -hmm. And I'm focusing on how sterile this environment looks like, mm -hmm. this entire movie. No, there's not one set on this character in, in this movie that feels like it's a real place. When people are in their homes, they feel like they're in stage rooms. Where they and I mean like I'm I mean like right out of Better Homes and Gardens. Mm -hmm. Um there's no personality whatsoever. And I understand this is kind of like the not too distant future sure, that it's sure. supposed to be presenting. It's, yeah. But still uh, a life that has been brought together, you want to see that life. It should you should feel the life in the room in which these people are occupied. You don't see it whatsoever. It, it, it's so cold and sterile. The movie is very slow, mm -hmm. um, and probably a good half hour mm -hmm. too Absolutely. long. Absolutely. Uh, and <coughs> it 
just unfortunately just a waste of a missed opportunity. John Ridley, not a bad screenwriter, not a bad. It's not a badly directed movie, but I just don't think it comes together. John Ridley, you've seen him uh, nominated for screenplay for Twelve Years a Slave. Um, he is actually the writer and director of the upcoming Netflix film Shirley. Uh, he, it's done some work in comic books as well. Um, he he is a writer of of some renown, but on this one he he this is not his A game. And I wanted to give this movie a, a bit of a pass because it's from two thousand two thousand twenty one, which means that it was filmed at the height of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So it probably had some challenges. I couldn't find anything that spoke to necessarily challenges in the in the filming of it, but it probably did have. I would imagine it did have some challenges with, you know, how the world was. Right, just the logistics, the logistics and, and things like that. And, yeah, but it's sure. a very. I mean, outside of the four actors that I mentioned, there maybe are five other people. Right, in the just movie. extras. Sometimes. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it the logistics. It, it's not shouldn't have been that hard to to juggle. Um, and and to be quite as kept, when you're dealing with a romance, if you cut out all the, all of the BS, that's the invitation to focus on the love, to focus on the love story that this movie purports to be about, and tries very hard to be about. It tries to end on this very strong love note. That just it it just falls flat because at the end you don't care about anything except getting to the final credits because the movie is way too long and it's a shame because I really went in wanting to like this movie so much but I it it's just too long too slow and just a waste. Um, I agree with almost everything you just said about the characterization and the way the actors are used. One thing I do disagree with you, I actually think that Nick and Cynthia Revo's character's name was... Um, it's, it's, he was Nick. He was Nick because he's, you know, the, the film is in three sections and he's the only character. Janine? In, 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 Janine. I actually thought Nick and Janine's home was warm. Hmm. Like, I actually, like, it felt like a... a, a, a a house to okay me. you know with the art on the wall and various f- pieces of furniture mm. and even the color scheme like it felt it felt very cool but it also seemed like the type of place that an upper middle class very well educated no children having uber successful couple would have like it was just like wow this is a cool ass house well yeah i'm a photographer he's an architect it's like, oh yeah, this is a cool ass house. But um your critique of the use of Cynthia Arrivo in this film and how she is basically an object is one hundred percent accurate. But I view it in a larger context of these love stories that we talk about, where where you could say the same exact you could say the you could have the exact same critique of Naomi Harris in My Beloved Swan Song mm-hmm. or Carrie Washington in My Beloved Django Unchained. Okay. I think that this is a film like those films that is from the viewpoint of this male character trying to get this woman. And not to put too fond of a point on it, but you know, as I just referenced Django and I and and Swan Song, I don't think for all we talk about these love stories and we talk about the great black romances and this and the other, we've talked about this before. Quiet as is kept, I think the great black romances that we talk about oftentimes are super problematic. So that a film where a black man and a white man are fighting using considerable, as you said, it's super expensive to do this time travel. You get the sense when the film starts that this has been ongoing over a woman who looks like Cynthia Erivo, 
a dark skinned black woman with a short natural from jump. I'm already in the bag for it. like, I'll just, just full disclosure. I'm already in the bag for it because anytime a black man is going above and beyond for a black woman on film, it's not that many examples of it, frankly. No, I hear you. Yeah. And certainly again, a black woman who looks like Cynthia Erivo. So there's that. I think Leslie Odom was a strong enough character that, that you know, as you said, you have these, you, we have, we see three time slips and the only consistent characters that we see, like, like Leslie Odom is on screen 90% of the time that we watch this film. If anything, it, 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 it was kind of a bait and switch. Like you look at the posters and it's, it's Cynthia Revo and it's Leslie Odom. And as you said, you think it's going to be this great romance between the two of them. And it's not. It really is Leslie Odom's character, Nick, trying to get to her. So just right there, I like it. The logistics of the time travel, um, you know, just the sci-fi nerd in me. I like the little details like time travel was something that was only for the rich. Mm. And that, 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 that sort of these cultural, the, the, these cultural, um, cultural shifts had, had happened where, you know, people kind of have protocols for when the time shift happens, like everybody calls their loved ones to make sure nothing has shifted. And, you know, of course, basically an insurance agency has popped up that can protect your memories. And, and I like that as well. I actually like the fact that the conflict, and, and you sort of alluded to that when you said Orlando Bloom's character is, is the antagonist. But I love the fact that as the film goes on, he's not a villain. No, yes, yes. Like, like you know, I love the fact that these are two men who find themselves at opposite ends because they love this woman. And frankly, the fact that he's not a bad person, I thought, was a wonderful reflection of Janine. Because if Janine had fallen in love with somebody who would just kind of run over people's lives and stuff, what does that say about her? And, 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 and how is she a judge of character? So I like that. I have to say my favorite part, you talked about, um, I just forgot the actress's name. Frida Pinto. Frida Pinto getting second billing. And certainly when you, these names that you said, it seems like she shouldn't be, you know, but watching this film, I absolutely think she deserves second billing <coughs> because her character, Alex, I thought was a great character. Mm. Like this woman who, who's kind of caught in this. And then my, my favorite part of the film is the fact that Nick and Alex, after the time shift happens and now he's not with Janine, the great love of his life, He's with Alex. This is a good relationship. Yeah. Like I love the fact that 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 he doesn't that that he is isn't resisting this relationship with Alex because this is bad. It's just not the right one. So that you had this wonderful kind of quiet exploration of what, what does being in love mean? Like, what does being in love mean? And, and again, this sense that if you don't find the person, like the person that you're meant to be with. You're right. It doesn't mean that your life is going to be, you, you know, you're going to have an eye patch and, and society's going to fall and you're going to be in the forest eating squirrel meat. Like, you might have a pretty good life. It's just not the life and and the fact that this character Nick kind of has this through line where he knows you know again this is a good life but this isn't the life that I'm meant to have 
that it worked for like it worked for me like like it worked for me that that as this sort of quiet film now it's absolutely a half hour too long like like there's no question a half hour of this could have been chopped off at least mm -hmm. um but I loved all the performances, including Orlando Bloom, who I have to I say. I like Orlando Bloom. I have to say, I don't, I've never really thought of Orlando Bloom as an actor, actor. Like I said, wow, Orlando Bloom is doing work here. Um, I love Leslie Odom. Like, I think Leslie Odom, I think John Ridley's instincts were right on to put this thing on Leslie Odom's shoulders. And he just carries this thing. Cynthia Erivo, look, man, unless Cynthia Erivo is in the entire film, you can argue that they wasted Cynthia Erivo. Like, like anything that Cynthia Erivo is in, that she's not acting, singing, emoting, you know, all this, because because it's Cynthia Erivo. So a disappointment that there's not more Cynthia Erivo is just, frankly, common sense. Mm-hmm. Because it's Cynthia Erivo, and of course Cynthia Erivo should be in it more. Because it's Cynthia Erivo, but I do, I, I, I do. It, it worked for me. See, I, it, it didn't work for me because, as you explained, Alex's character, Frida Pinto's character, mm -hmm. and saying that you like, like, the character. I, I don't. I, I like the actress. Mm -hmm. So what she's asked to do, she does well. Mm -hmm. But to me. She is, she just gets the screen time that Cynthia Revo should have gotten in this movie, but she's not given any, she's still not really given anything to do, but to sit there and pine over like, you know, maybe things going wrong with her and Nick. And then when things turn right, you know, feeling good about that. Uh, and then next thing you know, she is, she's because of, some time shenanigans. Right. She's with Orlando Bloom's character, Tommy, mm -hmm. at the end, and she's all good she's all good there. So I don't think you ever really get an opportunity to explore even her her thoughts in this movie. It's not about her thoughts. See, but but and you say that because the movie is about is about Nick. It's Nick, about Leslie right. about Leslie Odom. But if you're not given any chance to really explore her, her thoughts or even give a, a a thought about it. So now you're just focusing on Nick. Well, she spends a great deal of time with time with Nick. So we're not supposed to recognize the other person in the room. Let's worry about worry about Nick. Okay. Well, what Nick, what what is Nick dealing with? Nick is dealing with his pro, with his thoughts about Tommy, and at this point, he's not even sure of whether or not he right. wants he to get. He just knows something is off. He just knows something is off. So we know that it ha we know that it has to do with Tommy, and he is starting to learn that it has to do with Tommy. Meanwhile, Tommy, the Orlando Bloom character, he's over in Cynthia Revoville. He's not in, he leads a lot of the movie. So the antagonist is even going from Because the movie. it's about Nick. It's almost a character study. See, but it, it's a character study that wants to tell you what he's, go, what he's dealing with and watch him contemplate yes. dealing with this. Yes. Right? Exactly. But if I don't feel what you're going through, because I don't, because I don't think the movie does a good job of illustrating that, it's telling me. Oh, I felt, I felt <coughs> Leslie Odom. I felt it. I think he's a good actor, and I think what he's a, what he is emoting well. Yeah. And he, but I, but at the end of the day, I, just, uh, it, it still didn't connect with me because. Whatever tensions or frustrations or whatever he is he is feeling, mm -hmm. I don't see them being in any way pressing upon him. Oh, oh yeah, I disagree. I do. Look, and 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 look again. Leslie Odom makes or breaks this. But if if you don't buy it, then obviously it breaks it. But I was with him like. Like I was with him from the very, I was with him with the frustration and the suspicion that he thought this ex was doing stuff. I was there. I was there with 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 the the feelings of betrayal, 
when you find out what 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 Cynthia what, what Janine is doing Janine did, to try I, to I was there us. too but I would have also wanted to I wanted to see a little bit more of that flip side of why she why she was doing what she was doing look again you want something that I don't think the film was that interested in like I think this is Nick's film like Needle in a needle in a Tom stack, which frankly I think is the dumbest title I've ever heard of. I don't in my think it's life. an apt title. No. It should have been called Nick of Tom. See what I did? You see what I did? It should have been called Nick of Tom, and Leslie Odom's face should have been on the poster. This was the Leslie Odom show, and and I did. I was there. Like again. I love the subtlety of the story that Tommy didn't dick him. Like he woke up in a new future and he was destitute living in the alley. And the only friend he had was a rat that he named Charlie. No, I, I like, I, I love the fact that, that Tommy sets him <coughs> up. He's, this is a good, and to your sterility critique, I thought that was reflected in their house, in 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 Nick and Alex's house. Like it, this felt like a sterile house. Yes, and and I thought that that was a reflection of the fact that he and Alex were good, but this isn't what was meant to be. Like like to to you know, like I said, the one direct thing that I disagree with you, even the the use of lighting. In Janine and Alex's house, you had all this warm Janine sunlight. Hmm? Janine and Nick's house. You know, you had all this warm sunlight and everything coming through. And then, you know, with Alex, it's just sort of sterile and washed. Like, it's a beautiful home, but it was so sterile. And it's like one piece of art's on the wall. And, and then, you, you know, of course, it kind of goes from there. So I did. I bought it. I I was I was fully on board with Leslie Odom's Nick, kind of doing this journey. We haven't mentioned it. I also liked his relationship with his sister. I love the relationship with yeah. his sister, and that's the oh, see. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, because his relationship with his sister, and I think in a brilliant piece of casting by uh, Jaden Wong mm -hmm. uh, as his sister Zoe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that relationship was really, really, really strong and well developed in this movie. And I felt that. Mm -hmm. And I felt tension on on both sides. And I was invested in her story. Mm -hmm. And I think it's amazing that I'm invested in his sister's story more so than the other women in the romances in this movie. Right. Look, man. Y y look, I'm I'm generally never going to fight you but so hard when we say something like the female characters don't have a lot of agency the female characters don't have it and, and generally I'm 100% obviously aboard aboard talking like that but I do think that there is a space when we talk about how black women are positioned in these films. Okay. That again, I'm I'm putting this with Django Unchained, where again Kerry Washington has maybe four scenes. Yeah, but in the whole movie, and the movie's about Django going through hell. Uh, <coughs> Naomi Harris, I think, has a, a, a considerable amount more to do than than Cynthia Revo. Or or Carrie Washington in Swan in Swan Song, but even that, this is one hundred percent the Mahershala Ali show, where he's doing this, trying to trying to get do set this up for this woman, and yeah, and this this is the Leslie Odom show that yes, Cynthia Revo is nothing is not much more than an object. She is a prize being fought over between these two men. I, you are 100% right with that assessment of her. And if there were 50 movies from now on where all black women are cast as are as prizes sitting up on a shelf and black men are fighting to the death to get to her. And at some point you say, well, damn, she, can't, can't she, don't, don't she get to say something? Then I'd be with you. But because 
in the history of black films, in the eight years you and I've been doing this, talking about it, every you you know, I'll play you from my heart, and then she, then he plays her like he playing Norm Nixon or somebody, and 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 and, and, and you know what about my old man? And Mahogany got to come back and give up her career to help his middling ass political career, and um. And 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 what was 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 uh, was the other great black romance we always talk about? Where it's like, damn, it's you know the photograph and Issa Rae got to come and beg Lakeith Stanfield to be with her, and you know, God damn, this like I don't like I don't want my daughter to emulate any of this. This is all terrible. Yeah, I'll take this, but I guess the real question is. Would you recommend this? I would not recommend Needle in a Time Stack. I would not. No, I think it's a, a little bit way too long, a little sl too slow. Um, so, no, I, I regretfully would not recommend Needle in a Time Stack. Okay, I would. I also think it's way too long, like I said. But regardless, I think, I think the pluses really outweigh the minuses. I actually think it's a pretty smart film when we talk about time travel films and the way that actually looks like the logistics of it. I love the performances. Um, certainly they could be there. There could, again, I'm never going to fight you about more Cynthia Erivo, but I think Leslie Odom is a strong enough actor, a strong enough presence mm. and, and just, a, just strong enough to carry this. So I would recommend it. All right. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen, but don't let us be your judge. Go check out Needle on a Time Stack streaming someplace near you right now. Before we tell you what we're going to be reviewing next week here in Octavia April, I invite you to follow the Michelle Mission on the social media of your choice, whether it be Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, at Michelle Mission. On Facebook, you can join our Facebook group and become one with all of our missionaries that enjoy talking about movies and TV and stuff in our Facebook group. You can also... Like and subscribe to the Michelle Mission on YouTube. Hit the bell so you're notified of when we put up our our edited contact uh, films and shorts, and also be notified when we go live every Tuesday night from seven p at seven p.m. right here from Yunk Junk, Philadelphia's premier video podcast palace. If you want to have yourself and your podcast here at the Yunk Junk Palace, email our man Dylan at yunkjunk.com. That's D-Y-L-A-N at yunkjunk.com. The Michelle Mission is also a proud member of The Podglomerate, thepodglomerate.com. They make podcasts work, such as ours, who you can talk to directly by sending us an email at michellemission at gmail.com, M-I-C-H-E-A-U-X-M-I-S-S-I-O-N at gmail.com. Next week, here on the Michelle Mission, in the fourth week of Octavia April, we will sit down with Vincent Selection and watch Tiana Paris, mm. Jamie Foxx, mm. and John Boyega mm. do work mm. in the cloned Tyrone. Next week, here on the Michelle Mission, until then, he's Vincent, I'm Len, that's Dylan way over there, and in parting we say, we'll see you when it's time to meet again.